Hello, and welcome to the Justice and Coffee podcast. The podcast where we talk justice with a special guest over coffee. On this episode, I speak with Lexi Smith. Lexi is a trauma-informed consultant and anti-trafficking advocate heralding from Nashville, Tennessee. And in this podcast, we talk about a number of subjects, including pornography and child abuse. So please choose an appropriate time and place to listen to this. But please do listen. Let's not turn away when things are uncomfortable. Let's lean in and learn. I know, of course, that I'm preaching to the converted here. But much of what Lexi has to say is, in fact, a challenge to engage in the uncomfortable topics as a means of protecting those we love. And we get a great opportunity to do that here. I first got in touch with Lexi a couple of months ago when I was reaching out to the campaign group Exodus Cry, who are going to feature on the next podcast. And as Lexi and I were chatting, she shared with me some of her story and how she became an advocate in the anti-trafficking movement, and I was absolutely bowled over. She has so kindly offered to share her story with us on this podcast, but also to give us some great advice about how to respond appropriately to someone who has suffered significant trauma. There's some real gold in what Lexi has to say, so listen in and do share this episode with people who you think would do well to hear it. Lexi, welcome. What's it like in the US of A today? Uh, right at this very moment, it's rainy. I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so our summer is starting to kick off. Last night I went for a walk and it I could feel it. And I'm like, ah, oh, yes, summer is here. I'm excited. Oh, summer in Nashville sounds nice. We, uh, we in the UK, at least, it's been a very soggy start to our summer. I don't think we can say summer yet, start of May, but it's... It's been cold and wet. We had a good April. It's cold and wet here. I don't know if it's the same in the States, but we love to talk weather in the UK. It's what unites us all. It's the first thing. If you meet a stranger, the first thing you're going to say, you walk into a shop. God, it's dreadful outside, isn't it? And then even when we get good weather, we, we give us two days and we'll be complaining about it. Wow. Oh, it's too hot. It's, oh, it's too hot. It's too hot here. We need a bit of rain. It's, uh, it's a uniquely British attribute characteristic, I think. Well, I prefer that better than politics. I think that's like to go to with like strangers in the US and then people are ready to like fist fight a stranger they just met and waiting for like a taxi. <laughs> we had that. We had that for about three years. You couldn't meet a stranger without talking about Brexit. And uh, thank goodness it seems to have passed us by finally. It's certainly been relegated a few, a few notches. So. so there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> Come on, come on. I imagine it was particularly strong when you were leading up to the election, was it? Oh, yeah. You know, and even still after, because, you know, Americans are real sore losers. So anyone that their candidate lost, they're, you know, still very upset about that. <laughs> I can believe that. Now, Lexi, I'm going to show you my T-shirt. Can you see this sticker if I get close to the uh, camera? Oh. I can't read it, but I see the hearts and the crown. It's a little a sticker that we give out at our vaccination centers in the UK. <laughs> And it wow. says, I've had my jab. Amazing. Wearing it with pride. Now, this is not the subject of our, our, our conversation, neither. <laughs> it's, it's a high likelihood of getting edited out. But have you had your jab yet? I did. I was going to ask, how's your arm? Because I had, I definitely had the, what they call like the COVID arm. <laughs> and um, it was brutal. The first one was brutal. I like, it felt like I broke my arm. I've broken bones before. And I was like, I can't move my arm. Like, I had to have a friend like help me put jackets. Uh, it was just, it was ridiculous. So the second time I learned you have to like move your arm a lot right after and stretch and all that. And I really, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I've had a whole day <laughs> you're not moving this flipping arm. So listeners are going to hate me, especially the British ones, because it's actually my second jab. I am, I've managed to do a bit of a cue jump. I think people have in their mid thirties in the UK aren't, aren't, generally being invited for their jabs mm. yet but I was doing some work for the NHS and I was offered a jab and I thought yes so I've been able to sort of cue jump a few a few months so this is my second my first one I had a yeah I, I must admit I'm all for vaccinations but I had a terrible night with it 
Oh no. Yeah, like j shaking and 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 all sorts. Oh. It was so I'm prepared tonight. I'm like, I've got my paracetamol. I picked a Netflix series. So if I have to just tough it out oh, and no. sit in front of the telly all night with a thousand layers on, but still being cold, but being hot, but being cold, but being hot, then I'm I'm prepared. I've got my hot water bottle. I'm going to take it on. But I think apparently it's a good sign. Yeah, it's, it is good. It means your immune system's getting it done. And yeah, that's what it's for. Let's move from vaccines to coffee which is our normal, our normal starting place. I'm drinking decaf because in Norwich, which is where I am today, in the east of England, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. In Nashville, it's slightly earlier. So how early? Yeah, it's uh, about 11 a.m. here. Perfect time for a coffee yeah. break. Right. What you got? What are you armed with? I've got tea, actually, because I love coffee. I know, I know that face. Um, I love coffee. I used to be a barista, but uh, coffee stopped loving me. Actually, yeah, yeah due to like anxiety and um, allergies, actually. So I've literally become allergic, uh, which is the saddest thing on the planet. I'm like trying to find a fix to like reverse it somehow <laughs> because I love it so much. Um, and so every now and then I'll cheat and I'll do like a decaf. Um, but so I'm, I'm on tea. Tea is my thing. I, I understand that. I myself occasionally suffer from nasty indigestion. And mm -hmm. I wonder how much of that is caused by, uh, by the amount of coffee I've been drinking over the years. I think I've hurt myself. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, it's super acidic. And I, yeah. it's, it's like the first thing. I have so many people that have like stomach issues. I'm like, well, you know, what are you eating for something? Wednesday? They're like, eat. I have a cup of coffee. I'm like, well, you just dumped like a <laughs> pot of acid in your stomach. So like, no wonder yeah. you're just not starting it off well. <laughs> I've started um, my days with coffee and pop tarts recently, which I know you've got plenty of them in the US. Mm -hmm. I uh, I walked past a, a stand in a local. I've just moved house. I went in a local supermarket. That's I wasn't previously unfamiliar with, and there was a big stand of pop tarts. I couldn't walk past them, so now I'm doing a what a breakfast of champions: black coffee and a, a chocolate pop tart. And uh, uh, see, I wonder why I have health issues. Here's a trick: you need to get the strawberry pop tarts, put them in the freezer. Oh, really? Yeah, yes, so good. <laughs> How come? What you eat them like a lollipop or something? In the freezer, they don't get like frozen solid. They're still like chewy, mm. um, but they're cold, so it's almost like it's like an ice cream sandwich, but not like with the ice cream. I mean, you could put ice cream in between it if you wanted to like chuck, go that far. That in as well. And plus it's strawberry. So it's one of your five a day. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> so Lexi, we were talking a few weeks ago. I was reaching out to you, but ostensibly to the campaign group exodus cry to see whether we could get to know each other potentially have a podcast together and you work for them in their communications department so why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about who exodus cry are yeah so um uh and just like a little a little about me i'm kind of a, an independent or I'm, I'm i'm a consultant in the u.s so i work with like a number of of nonprofits and uh over the last six or so, um, one of the main ones I've been working with is Exodus Cry, um, who is responsible for the um, Trafficking Hub campaign that's kind of swept, not just the US, but really kind of the world. It's really been amazing to be part of something that's united um, this fight against sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, very rarely, I think, are there things that, even though there's a lot of us, you know, we have the same heart and the same mission and desires and, and goals, um, it is a little bit difficult to get everyone to work together and to agree on um, something completely, right? Like there's always a little bit of nuance. So- um, Why don't you just say what Trafficking Hub is all about? Sure. Yeah. So, so Trafficking Hub is a campaign um, to hold uh, the company MindGeek, who owns uh, Pornhub, as well as hundreds of other porn websites, accountable for their crimes against humanity. Um, there has been, it's basically a tube site. So it's like YouTube for porn. And so, which means anyone can upload anything and they really weren't checking, you know, if, if things being uploaded were consensual. Um, if it was actual rape versus, you know, something produced, 
um, not you know keeping the categories and things like that under control. So like one of the most common um, search categories is teen, which is illegal, you know, I think in most developed, all developed countries. Um, so things like that. And uh, we've, you know, had quite success. There's, you know, all pretty much the major funders have pulled, you know, from the MasterCard, Visa, Discover Card, you can't, they won't process payment um, through them anymore, which is huge. Cause once, once you pull money, people get real motivated to make some changes. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been incredible to be a part of, of that and watch this really small team. Really Exodus Cry is, is a very, you know, still small nonprofit, just doing a lot of really big things, mm. um, which is really inspiring. And uh, they have been around for, man, they've been in this fight, I believe since 2007. And they kind of began um, with a documentary that sort of revealed um, human trafficking across the globe and the US um, called Nefarious Merchant of Souls. And that's kind of something that kicked it off. And um, we use a lot of, we create a lot of media pieces as opportunities to really have these big cultural conversations that hopefully will lead to cultural shifts. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of uh, in, in a nutshell, a bit of what we do. We obviously you know, do a little bit of outreach and working with um, survivors of sex trafficking as they come to us through our campaigning because um, you know, naturally people will resonate. Oh my gosh, that happened to me. You know, how do I get help? What do I do? And we don't have, you know, housing or anything like that, but we're kind of a, a big connector and we kind of make sure that people are getting taken care of. And, um, our, our next big thing is really honing in on protecting children, um, spe specifically protecting them from early exposure to pornography, which has, significant detrimental effects to especially a child's psyche and their sexual development um, when they're exposed early on. And um, I think, you know, the average numbers that we hear is like the, the typical average exposure is around like 10, 11, 12. Um, but we've recently been doing some surveying ourselves and we're finding a lot of people being exposed at like five, six, seven, you know, like very, very young. And um, you know, at those ages, um, you might not even be interested like in, in anyone in like a romantic way at all. I think like kindergarten, maybe kids start having crushes on one another, but it's not, you know, doesn't really go any, any further than that. And so, uh, that's kind of our, our next really big focus. And how did you first hear of Exodus Cry? How did, how did you get connected? How did you come to be a consultant for them? Um, I have known about them for a really long time. They actually, um, the, the film, I, the first film they did nefarious, they did a college touring, uh, screening of it. Oh and they came God. to my, they came to my college campus. Um, and I watched the film and it was shortly after I had finally identified as a survivor of sex trafficking. I'd been involved in the field for years actually, <laughs> and didn't identify just because of, um, how commonly the media sensationalizes um, what it actually looks like and what those scenarios um, are. Mm. And so I, I actually didn't even identify as a survivor of sex trafficking until um, you know my college years and this film came through and just really helped me uh, solidify that even more, which um, was really difficult actually um, to receive that it's, you know, almost a little bit of a label, you know, yes. um, and being like, oh my gosh, like that, that happened to me. That's just feels so surreal and bizarre. Um, just cause you think it's like an over there problem. Like you, you know, like you think it's India, you think Thailand, you think, you know, all these other, other places, never you, never your own backyard, never anyone, you know. So that's where I first heard about them. And I just have followed them ever since and have loved their, um, really strong um, stances on, you know, abolition and um, really not backing down and having the really hard conversations. And specifically that a lot of these hard conversations they have and the, the topics that they're willing to tackle really go after uh, the demand side of sex trafficking, addressing that and the root system of sex trafficking. So rather than just like 
you know, doing these little awareness campaigns and like, okay, we're just going to pull the weeds out of the ground, but we're not going to do a whole lot about the roots that are there. And every year it's going to come back up or it's going right. to get worse. It's going to multiply underground. They're actually like digging, digging it all up. They're like taking a, a big backhoe in and just ripping it all up. And I love that. I love that they're, they're willing to have those hard conversations and, you know, deal with all the, the criticism and the crazy that can, that can come with it. I think that's really interesting. I've tried to, I've tried not to plan my podcasts too far in advance. I want to be able to be responsive to what's going on at the moment. So try like this will go out probably in a few weeks. That's it's yeah. not going to come out in six months time. And, and, but it's hopefully, hopefully to people that listen regularly, will see that I'm at least attempting to curate something that takes, takes me and the listeners on a bit of a journey and it's interesting a couple of the things that you've said there one of it being the demand side so the issue of demand has come up recently on our podcasts and we spoke to a man called John Tanago who works for an organization called IJM I know you're familiar with and he talked about targeting the demand side for for users of and abusers of online child abuse users uh, viewers of online child abuse and how terribly uh, lenient courts are around the world, including in the UK, terribly lenient when people are found to be committing these offences and how it's in no way uh, representative of what of the crime that's taking place because of the demand. That's, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not paying for it, if you're not asking for it, this material is unlikely to be produced. It's, so that's something that we're sort of learning. And it's also also having a voice and being willing to be unpopular. And being willing to stand up for what you believe in is very much something we discussed in our last episode. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I feel like we're on, we're on a journey together. And it's really interesting that you've mentioned those things. So when I wrote the notes before this interview and had an idea of what I'd like to ask you, I've titled you as an, a, a trauma-informed counsellor and anti-trafficking advocate. I could now add consultants to that. But you also mentioned something about going to high school and watching this nefarious documentary and realizing that you, your life identified with this theme, but not feeling comfortable with label. And, and do you mean by the label being labeled a victim? Is that, is that the, the label that you, you felt uncomfortable being associated with? Yeah, definitely the victim label. But I mean, even you know, a survivor of sex trafficking, survivor of um, child abuse material, you know, survivor of like porn industry. I mean, really, because it just, it's unheard of. And it felt so sensational to like label that to my life when I felt so ordinary, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm just like a normal person. How could that have happened to me? And it was easier for me. It was very easy. I always called it sexual abuse. I always called it, you know, um, rape, like all of that, you know, like that was very easy because it's more often talked about. And I think what we're seeing happen is the more that we're talking about human trafficking and the different types of human trafficking, which if you're not familiar, there's actually 10 different types of human trafficking that, that occur. And I think the more it gets talked about, the more survivors, you know, are speaking out, the more people are being like, are saying, oh my gosh, me too. That's what happened. Like, I've never been able to place it or, you know, meet someone that anything like that happened to. I just, so I just thought that I was nuts. Like, yeah. I was like, well, maybe it didn't happen because I, it's never happened to anyone else. And there's something about that, um, finding people with, you know, the same story, that, that same common thread that I think is making it a lot more comfortable for people to, to talk about it and um, to identify as that. But back, let's see, when I, when I really started that process, it was like 2008. So really long time ago, you know, the, you know, the words human trafficking weren't even a thing. I think uh, very, very often, I think it was only, you know, maybe 10 years prior to that, that it became like a vocabulary term, you know, that you could find in any legislation. It was like one, piece of legislation in, in the US and really just referred to, um, you know, internationals being brought over for one reason or another, not necessarily the domestic um, sex trafficking that was going on here in the States. And that subject, I think, is fascinating because there's a, 
Well, there's two sides to it, isn't there? The positive part of what you've just said is that by witnessing this documentary put on by X, the Scrying the Nefarious documentary, you were able to, well, a great positive came from it. It, it helped you identify something that had taken place. And I, I would expect it, it was a new stage in your journey of, of recovery uh, from that. But also the bad side of it being there is a sensationalized uh, attempt to cover this subject. There is media's attempt to condense what is a complex and sensitive issue into something that is a sound bite, something mm -hmm. that's going to get people's attention, sort of headline material and, and imagery and words and snip, snippets of stories that can be quite unhelpful and almost exploitative in nature in the way they cover what are incredibly sensitive and painful subjects and parts of people's lives. It's getting that right is a job. And sometimes well, I've certainly seen plenty of examples of where I've been left feeling uncomfortable, feeling that people's stories have been somewhat exploited for entertainment, not for mm -hmm. empowerment. How do you feel about that? Um, I 100% agree. There's actually, I left the anti-trafficking movement for several years for that very reason, just because I felt that I was being asked to come, you know, speak at a conference or speak, you know, at, at different events. And I was being paid to do it. I, there was a, we won't go there. That, that it's a whole soapbox, <laughs> but um, there was a time that I was not being paid and being manipulated very much like my traffickers um, saying, oh, well, don't you want to help? Don't you want to prevent this? You know, you should be want, you should want to share your story, um, which is just, I, yeah, anyway. Um, so fast forward and I, you know, finally, you know, got the skill to start, you know, asking and negotiating pay. And even with that, there was still just this element of, I felt like a zoo animal mm -hmm. and I felt like uh, a piece of entertainment rather than a person that was not only had a lived experience that I was willing to share. That, 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 if anyone's worried what's just happened to Lexi, that is her dog having a, a jolly good shake next day. <laughs> um, I, yeah, so I definitely experienced that of feeling like a piece of entertainment um, rather than a professional that brought skill to the table alongside my story. My, um, and my story isn't all that I am. You know, I have at this point over 10 years of experience in this field, working with survivors, working with law enforcement, working with lawyers, you know, all kinds of people working with the community, training people, doing outreach. And um, I wanted to be asked to, to the table for those reasons, because I'm an intelligent woman that had something to offer rather than a piece of, you know, entertainment, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a story, you know, no different than, you know, maybe a musician or something like that. Like, here, buy a ticket to like hear this person's story. It just like felt so gross. And so I stopped doing it completely. I, I like left the field entirely um, and just kind of went off into, you know, marketing and communications just like full time did that for a while. Um, but it's, I can't get away with it, uh, get away from it at the end of the day. Like it's my heartbeat. It's, you know, it's, it, I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's something that, it's not healthy for every every survivor to remain in this field or come back to the field. Um, and you kind of have to figure out like your boundaries with that and what's um, good and not, you know, good for you. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, it's, it's very clear that this is, you know, it's where I belong. Well, Lexi, you so kindly, when we spoke a few weeks ago, you were so very kind in offering to, to share your story with us. And uh, we'd love to hear, from you and, and hear your narrative. And I think there's lots of interesting points there. One of which being a story that really challenges perceptions. And I think that's important for us uh, in our podcast series to do that, to ask us all to take a second look at an issue and to avoid stereotypes and assumptions. And I thought that's what's particularly interesting about what you shared with me when we chatted. So in your own time please share as little or as, as much Perfect. as you want I'd love for you to to share with us yeah, where, the, yeah. where the story began for you yeah thank you um 
I will do my best to keep it brief. And so I'll let, you know, the audience know if they want to hear more or, you know, different pieces, more about different pieces, they can head over to like my social media. I, I kind of break things down a little bit more in depth um, throughout my Instagram page um, because it's a lot, you know, I'm, I'm wrapping up several years of, of trauma, frequent trauma into like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> So there's lots of missing pieces, but yeah, you're right. And, and I think th this is part of why I feel it's important to kind of continue to make the sacrifice and telling my story. Cause it's not easy. It definitely can like bring more stuff up. I have to pay a therapist, you know, like consistently and just make sure like I'm, I'm good there. But the reality is, is my story, I think, is so shocking to people because they could see it happening to their daughter. They could see it happening to the, you know, kid down the street. Um, because I grew up in the middle in middle class America, um, the home that I was trafficked out of, I experienced um, residential trafficking is is like the category of sex trafficking that I experienced. When I posted some pictures of this house, and it looks like a leave it to beaver neighborhood, like literally happened in a cul-de-sac you know, in a nice neighborhood. My family was really involved in the community, um, really involved in a faith community. We, we were constantly in church, um, really just the type of family that you thought had it all together. There was nothing wrong there. There was nothing going on in my home. There's not like, a, you know, overt abuse going on in my home that would necessarily make me more vulnerable. Um, I wasn't running away from home. I didn't have a drug problem. I just was conveniently, you know, wrong place, wrong time somewhat, but that's happening constantly nowadays, especially with social media and the digital age. Cause back then, I, you know, we didn't have anything like that. I didn't have a cell phone. Um, I wasn't talking to random people. We had instant messenger. Um, and I would talk to people on there sometimes, but not to the extent of what kids are experiencing now online. Mm. And I think that's something that, that a lot of people have a hard time comprehending that just because your, your child isn't necessarily potentially dating a trafficker or speaking to someone in person at school or, you know, what, however, in person doesn't mean that they're not talking to someone doesn't mean that they're not being exploited out of their bedroom while you're downstairs making dinner. It's very, very, very common, very common. And so what happened for me was, um, I think part of really what made me vulnerable was my family's inability to comprehend that something like that could ever happen to me. Obviously that wasn't even on anyone's radar back then. Like this is like early two thousands, not even on the radar. But I don't even think the possibility of being sexually abused was even on, on their radar. Um, just because they did take such good care, they did um, you know, try to keep tabs on where I was and what I was doing, but it still happened, it still happened to me. And basically what happened was my, um, my grandmother had, there was a, a young boy that lived a couple doors down and he did not have a good home life and he did not have adults you know, that cared a lot about him or enough of them around. And so um, she would invite him over for dinner and make sure he, you know, had at least one good hot meal a day and that someone nearby cared about him if he ever needed anything, which is a great, beautiful thing, right? Yeah. You would, you know, we would all hope to hear more stories like that. However, they didn't monitor his access to me and we were allowed to play as if we were close in age and really without much um, supervision or conversation. There, were never, there was never a conversation of, you know, what is appropriate touch? If you feel uncomfortable with him, please let me know and let me know why you're not gonna be in trouble. You know, things like that. And, and I think parents assume that their kids just know that they can come to them, but you really don't. I think as a kid, all of us remember this feeling of like, you're constantly somehow gonna get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're still trying to figure out life. And, um, you just used to your parents kind of squawking at you all the time. And so you're always afraid of getting in trouble. I feel like even if you grow up in a great home, you know, and there's no abuse present, you're just like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to screw up somehow and somehow get grounded or yelled at. So that, that never happened. And we, he developed a, a sexual relationship with me like very quickly. Um, and I had 
previously kind of been primed for this through other sexual abuse that happened earlier prior to meeting him um, through other family members, um, like distant cousins that I was frequently around. And not, I think that does make me vulnerable a little bit more so, made me a little bit more vulnerable simply because I had already been conditioned to um, that type of activity. So there wasn't going to be a significant shift in my demeanor as a child. And that's something people are always like, well, how'd your family not know? It's not, and I think people don't understand uh, how vastly different child psychology is from adult and the way children respond to yes. issues. You know, um, depression in children often shows up as anger and rage and outbursts, which also is like a normal child thing, you know, yes. like kids can just be moody, especially teenagers, especially preteens. And so it's really easy to brush stuff off and explain it as something else or just part of their normal development. And that's why, you know, I think hearing from professionals is really important and, and letting your child see a professional just to make sure, you know, that it is a normal thing and there's not something else going on. Um, and so I, I was really used to that kind of activity and kind of fast forward things. There's a bit of like a, a grooming period for probably about six months um, to a year before he actually sold me uh, to one of his friends. And the way that he would do this was he told me to pretend like I was riding my bike around the neighborhood, which a very normal activity for kids in the early 2000s. You just hop on a bike, tear up the neighborhood till the sun went down and come back. Um, but typically I wouldn't be gone for more than an hour, which wasn't enough time to alarm anybody. And he would tell me to pretend like I was riding my bike and there's a path that kind of cut through his backyard. And so I would get on that path appear as if I was taking this path into a wooded area and then end up in his backyard going into his house. So, um, he, that's kind of how it, it got arranged and, um, it was very clear pretty quickly that he wasn't inspired to do this alone, that there was someone that had been training him, that he had been recruited into an organized crime group. He wasn't just this like mastermind 16 year old, you know, criminal. He was vulnerable too. He didn't have people either. And he found a group of people that, you know, helped take care of him. And there's all kinds of, of stuff there and reasons why, you know, kids and children gravitate to gangs and organized crime groups. And that's kind of what happened to him. And so things kind of started out, him and I, um, he filmed um, some sexual activity, some different events. And after that, there was, a, there was a major shift in what I can just assume is that they used that footage to advertise me to potential buyers in the community. And this is kind of like dawn of internet pornography, like around this time, right? Um, so there's really like no regulation on stuff. Like it's not really being watched by law enforcement or anything like that. And so I have no idea how it was distributed, but. Could you tell us what age you were at this time? Uh, I was 10, like between 10 and 11 by this time. So we met uh, when I was like around nine. Um, and again, same scenario, he would have me pretend like I was riding my bike around the neighborhood. And, but when I would arrive to his house, there were other people there, you know, one person would, would take the money. Uh, one person would stay in the room and like monitor the purchase session. Really the rape session is what it was, um, to make sure that no one was too rough with me or ended up you know, accidentally killing me or, you know, whatever make, or, and also made sure that I was compliant. Um, cause I obviously had moments of panic and freaking out. And, um, so they, they quickly kind of learned that a, they needed to kind of suppress my system a little bit. So they started lightly drugging me. And I always remember after these events, I would end up going back to my grandmother's and I would just sleep for like several hours. And it's what, what can I, what I can assume what they gave me was roofies. That's really all I can assume. And when these people would, or right before these people would arrive, I was forced to watch pornography because the very first buyer I had, I completely freaked out um, and started sobbing, which, you know, 
when you're looking at this from a business model standpoint, which is how they looked at it, that's bad business. You know, no one wants to show up with, with a crying person. And so they realized that they had to kind of prepare me for what was about to happen. And that's how they did it. And they would force me to watch porn. And then those acts would immediately follow with a stranger, complete stranger that I've never met. And um, I was never allowed to know anyone's name. They were extremely careful in how they went about this. Um, and obviously my story is not, you know, uh, everyone's story is, is very, very different, right? Um, but this is just, you know, my particular experience. And um, it's interesting, all, all, the, all of this happened during the day, like in the middle of the day, typically in the summer when I was off school. So I was spending more time at my grandmother's house. And it was like, they came right from work. Like they would like literally like take off a suit jacket and they like looked nice and presentable. Um, pretty much all of them, I remember had wedding rings on. Uh, they varied in age, they, but they all seemed like professional men that were coming to purchase a 10, 11, 12 year old. And the only reason it, it ended was because I hit puberty. And once I developed breasts, they were completely disgusted and not interested because they were obviously pedophiles. Um, and that was like that layer of trauma was even more devastating, right? It's like, all this is happening to me and these like horrible people doing horrible things to me. And then there's this layer of like completely rejecting my womanhood that I really like had to work through and, and led to eventually me having an eating disorder and all kinds of stuff. So around, it kind of ended like right as I was about almost turning 13 or, you know, around 13 years old. And they just like literally disappeared and the kid disappeared too. Um, by that point he was, he had graduated high school. And I remember asking about him, like, you know what happened to him? Like, where'd he go? And there was like, you know, we don't know in the community, he was kind of seen as like a burnout. And so they just assumed he was out partying with someone somewhere and no one, you know, was really all that concerned. And shortly after uh, my family relocated. So all of this happened in the suburbs of Chicago. And we relocated to, to Tennessee shortly after, um, which I think was really good for me, but I actually didn't have like all these memories really at all until my college years is when a lot of these things started um, kind of resurfacing. Did your family move to, from Chicago to Tennessee because of what happened to you? No, they had no idea. They had no idea what happened to me. Um, they didn't know until my college years when a lot of stuff started coming up and I became really unstable mentally and physically. They're getting calls from, you know, my university saying I'm collapsing on campus and I'd been to the ER because I'd had a, um, a flashback that just kind of completely shocked my system and I couldn't communicate or move for hours. Um, and so they were, you know, terrified and didn't know what was going on. And it was a lot. Uh, it took years for them to accept what happened and uh, which is understandable. It's a very normal response, especially for families when something kind of goes on within the home or right under the nose of caretakers. It's pretty typical for them to respond in denial just because that's a lot to look at that's a huge failure as, as someone, you know, that it's your primary role to protect this child and you miserably failed, like, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, yeah, so they, they definitely had no idea. The relocation was because of finances and lifestyle, you know, wanting to have a different lifestyle than anything else. So I imagine your parents were incredibly shocked when this news finally made its way to them and you explained where you believe this this had all come from how did how did that go oh it was really hard for a long time um there's a, a really big deep separation for a couple of years I would say um and then finally my mom started just kind of learning more about trauma and learning more about specifically sexual trauma and she was able to piece together a lot of things and that, you know, alone in my childhood didn't necessarily like raise a red flag, but all of them together, like if you go down the list of 
signs to look out for children that are being sexually abused, I ticked pretty much all of them. <laughs> and so she was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So that, and then just hearing from, from professionals, you know, from, from the psychologists and psychiatrists that I was seeing and, you know, there's, there was this big stupid theory in the eighties that went around. It's so dumb. It's not true at all, but it plagues still a lot of survivors. I just spoke to someone yesterday that was, there was some study that came out stating that there could be false memories, things that, you know, come into your consciousness that aren't, aren't actually real, but it's been completely debunked. However, the debunking research hasn't circled like the original, just because the original just seems so sensational. Yeah. Um, and obviously there are some things with memory that can, can be, you know, iffy or whatever. However, you know, if you're able to recall a lot of things and it's, you know, not something you've ever seen in a movie. And that's something that I was told, like a lot of my family's like, Oh, you're, you probably just saw a movie and you're making it out to be your life. And I'm like, I've never seen a movie, like what I'm remembering. And I would never watch a movie, like what I'm remembering. It's yeah. horrific. Did Absolutely. You that, did you horrific. say that was family members that had made that suggestion? Yeah. Yeah. I had family members calling me, telling me I was crazy and that I was imagining things and you know, convincing myself that it was my real life. And, you know, I don't like hanging up on people or things like that, but I, you know, I I did, I did have to do that to people I love very much and say, you know, I'm sorry, you can't accept this, but it did happen. And this is not helping me at all. It's not helping me heal. If you can't accept it, then we can't be in relationship like period. Mm. Um, and had to draw some really strong boundaries for myself for several years. Um, and finally, you know, my family came around and I'm really fortunate to have that part of my story. A lot of survivors don't have that. Most survivors have to cut off their families completely, mm -hmm. especially those that experience familial trafficking, which is trafficking within the home, typically by, you know, a direct caretaker. That's not what happened in my case. So I didn't really have to come to that hard decision. But yeah, it took, it took a while and, but eventually they, they've, they've accepted it and they're really supportive and, you know, proud of me for, for what I do and my advocacy and how I've chosen to, um, you know, take the power back from those people that, you know, everything that they took from me, I'm kind of reversing it on them and um, it feels, feels really good. And they, it's something that they're happy that I'm able to do. Well, I think you're an excellent spokesperson, Lexi. So it's so it's good to hear you, like you say, exercise what is an awful thing and 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 use it to to some good in regard to 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 bringing these issues into public and to discussing them. And you mentioned some things to look out for for parents. Like your situation was ticking mm -hmm. most of those boxes, but your parents had missed it. Perhaps you could share some of those. Yeah, of course. Um... So uh, a lot of times trauma will come out um, physically. The, the body will speak when things are too overwhelming for a child to find words for. So I often had these like really mysterious stomach pains. I frequently had bladder infections. I slept a lot. I slept a lot. Um, you know, I, I would come home from elementary and I would take like a two, three hour nap. That's really not normal. <laughs> Um, I, in school, they, um, diagnosed me with ADHD or for ADD and dyslexia, which is somewhat accurate. However, what was happening was I would go to school and I would be dissociating the whole day. So I, my teacher, the way my teacher described it to my mom, when, you know, you have your, uh, parent teacher things and you kind of get an update on how, how your child's doing, she would say, you know, Lexi's here, but she's not here. Uh, you know, she's kind of just drifted off and I don't know if she's daydreaming or what's going on there. And so they thought it was a develop, like a educational development issue. Really, it was trauma. <laughs> mm. I had a really difficult time connecting to people. I had a really difficult time managing uh, my moods and my emotions, very explosive. Um, I dealt with night terrors and had trouble sleeping. I was depressed. And, and again, depression shows differently in children. Um, the way, you know, I, I had a lot of anger and I would, you know, as kids, um, kids are a lot better at, at trying to get their emotions out 
even if they don't have words for it. And I would take bouncy balls and I would chuck them at my wall. <laughs> and my mom would come in the room. She's like, you were going to blow a hole in my wall. You have to stop, you know? So it can look different um, for, for all kids. And so I would just encourage people to kind of do like a quick, you know, search on the internet and just get that list of, of stuff and make sure that's kind of in front of you. Even if it doesn't, may not apply to your children at some point, it could apply to a child that you might come across at some point in your, in your life that will give you a bit more of a red flag system. Um, but the biggest thing I tell parents is to trust your gut. And that's something that my mom and my family deeply regret because they had um, a sense about this, this boy that ended up being my recruiter into this trafficking situation, as well as the boys that abused me when I was younger prior to that situation. But they didn't feel like they had enough reason or evidence to, you know, not allow me to be around them. And so they just kind of let it continue. And that is their biggest regret. And so that's, that's the biggest thing I tell people is just trust your gut. Like you don't have to have a reason that's there um, to as like a protection measure. Everyone has it. Even if, you know, at, like as a survivor of trauma, sometimes ours, we feel like ours can be a bit broken, but it's actually even more tuned in, I think, than, than other people. So if you have an off feeling about a person or a, a child's friend or whatever, just trust that and have a, even just have an open conversations with your kids of like, Hey, do you ever feel uncomfortable around this person? They'll tell you, but yeah. oftentimes they need to be invited to have those conversations because either they don't know how to initiate that. They don't have the vocabulary for that, or, you know, they just, they need help. And that's why there's adults around them. Like it's our job to try to, to help children navigate things and find language for stuff. Mm. Um, but most of all, I really wish someone would have taken me to a child psychologist, a play therapist specifically, because there was a time that I did speak about the trauma that happened prior to my trafficking um, and it, I talked about it during, while my trafficking was going on. And, and if people had, if people had responded properly to that situation, which would have been to get me into mental health care with a professional that, you know, specializes in that they would have found out more information and people could potentially be in jail, you know, yeah. serving sentences that they should serve, but they're not. I think there's a huge expectation that is wrongfully placed on a child to come forward and make allegations about what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. But they're not developed. The psychology is, is, as you say, totally different to an adult psychology in, in understanding and reasoning what's right and what's wrong. And fear is such a huge influence on their decisions and, and how they act. So to yeah. those people that would ask, well, why didn't, why didn't she say something to her parents? as a young child when this was taking place perhaps that question should be should be different and it should be mm -hmm. it should be posed to 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 people who are responsible for your care and 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 why aren't yeah. they having these conversations why haven't they given this child access to, to discuss these issues i've heard you articulate brilliantly when i was doing some research lexi on 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 use of language is introducing children not being too concerned about parking issues of their bodies, right? Talking about their genitalia and, and being familiar with telling mum about things or dad about things. And rather than, oh gosh, we're not going to confront that, right? Certainly as a British kid, <laughs> this is not something we discussed. And I think there was a sex education class that we encountered in high school. I don't know, I think what you'd call Five, maybe fourth grade well fourth grade in the u.s about year nine is what i'd call it so maybe like 14 okay. is that, is yeah. that right yeah. and at which point half the kids in your class are having sex oh yeah 14 For 15 sure. you know it's it's too late to start That's okay definitely. so now we're finally awkwardly all going to stand around and <laughs> shuffle in our seats as our some poor teacher excruciatingly goes through what sex is and how to put on a condom and all these things and we, we've got to do that earlier haven't we appropriately of course but but it, it's a preventative measure don't ignore the subject don't shuffle away from it out of awkwardness or whatever you know a sense of protection almost i don't want to confront it. it's such a awful reality or let's just hope that 
we don't have to confront it but that's not helpful is it yeah no not at all i think i think you're you're spot on and i think like what i described earlier in in the reason why the trafficking ended was because the fantasy was broken and when you teach a child like you know straight away this is your penis this is your vagina and we use those terms if they ever encounter someone rather than teaching our child to say no you can't touch me in my privates which is i feel like that's pretty common um language like that is actually stimulating for a predator mm -hmm. and if a child uses the proper terms it breaks that fantasy right straight away and they're like oh shoot someone's talking to this kid they're gonna tell like nope i'm out um and you're right talking to like kids um sexual education should be coming from home should be coming from parents and it's so i get it it's so awkward it's so weird um there's tons of great curriculum on on how to do that but the problem is is in my case i was primed for trafficking and sexual exploitation um by predators actually peers peers of mine that were predatorial peers um and kids now have the same situation but they're also being primed by culture and by media, by the things that they're consuming, whether it's in their home or they're just hearing it happenstance, you know, around class. For example, I grew up in a very conservative home. I didn't even receive the sex talk until uh, probably way late <laughs> comparatively. And however, you know, you still hear things in class. Uh, I wasn't allowed to listen to uh, lots of music, but you still heard it at school. Okay and different things. And there's, there's no way to just keep your home a bubble. And that's not helpful anyway, because at some point your child has to leave your home and become an adult and a functional person in society. And so we need to empower them with the tools to do that and understanding, understanding what my boundaries are, you know, once they get a little bit older and they are developing a sexuality, what feels comfortable and not comfortable to me rather than a culture saying, oh, it choking is normal now. You should be fine with that. Everyone does it. It's fine. But if you're in a situation and it terrifies you, then you're not okay with, then don't do that. But there's just a lot of grooming just by our media and our culture that kids are ending up in abusive relationships and they're not identifying it as abuse. And I think, you know, especially the generation, uh, you know, like Gen Z and, you know, younger millennial. I, I think the, the significant increase in a lot of mental health issues, especially with like the, the younger generations has comes from a lot of these expectations. Like they're expected to tolerate abuse because it's been so normalized and it's having such a detrimental effect on them. And no one feels like they can be uncool and be like, no, actually I'm not okay with that. I'm not mm. okay with being spit on and yelled at or thrown around or whatever, you know? Um, and that is the kind of sex that middle schoolers are having now. Like, I need people to understand that. Like, your 14-year-old, their first sexual experience, they're probably being choked, slapped, spit on, like, peed on, all kinds of just crazy things that, like, as, as adults, as you and I, were like, I would never, <laughs> you know? Like, um, that's just not something that the majority of us have experienced, but that is something the majority of the next generation is experiencing sexually and no one's having conversations with them about, Hey, you don't have to be, you actually don't have to be okay with that. And you can have boundaries and you can, you know, here's how you have a conversation with someone before you engage with them sexually. Hey, here's what I'm not okay with. And if you do this, it's done. Like we're not, we're not talking. Um, and I think, you know, the idea of, of talking to kids about sex, I think people feel that it's encouraging them to do that but it really isn't They're If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. And you want to be the resource rather than um, the internet and that, or their peers, because yeah. what's happened with uh, that's kind of how it's been is a lot of people have, you know, tried to take an abstinence approach. Um, and it's, it's led to where we're at now, you know, like, and it's, it's nowhere good. So we kind of have to shift things back around and really start, having those conversations with kids. And it can be a simple, you know, you can start by, you know, if you hear a song that your kid is singing or, you know, is popular at the time or is trending on TikTok and it's 
really explicit. We'll use WAP like as a you know right. as an example. You know, right. um, hey, are you you know just asking about the lyrics? Like, hey, you know, what do you like about this song? And most kids will be like, oh, I love the beat. It's just like really great and it's fun to dance to. Like, okay, great. However, you know, there's lyrics there and you're, you're still absorbing that into your unconscious mind. That's still informing how you look at relationships and, um, you know, what you're going to do there. And so let's have a conversation about those lyrics. Like, do you actually agree, you know, with these things? Like, are you actually okay with that? If someone did that to you, would that be comfortable? And just helping them think that through because their brain literally isn't developed enough to do that. Like the, the prefrontal cortex of of your brain doesn't fully develop till 25 actually. So all the dumb decisions that all of us make in college, you can blame it on that afterward. You're just an idiot, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) That was my prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's not there. And that's where you do your critical thinking. Um, And the system isn't even in place. And so as adults, we have to help, you know, teenagers and young adults think that stuff through and, help build those, you know, neurological connections for them. I think you've, you've articulated that brilliantly. So you skimmed slightly over this <laughs> WAP song. I don't know whether that was you just, just um, condensing it for the sake of sparing my blushes, but I think of different people when I'm recording these podcasts sometimes, and I know one of my most faithful listeners is, of course, my mom, right? <laughs> And you, I really want to go into this, but let you know, let hashtag transparency at Blue Bay. You know, we want to, we want to bring these issues in, not for the sake of being sensationalist, but from the sake of being real and effective. And so the song um, Lexi's referring to is WAP is is an acronym W A P for wet ass pussy. Yep. And it's uh, it caused some controversy because it was like a number one in the UK. I don't know if it charted in the US. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> And, the, and there was a writer in The Guardian that came out and said why this was such a feminist song. That men have been singing w- with those sorts of lyrics or even more sexually aggressive lyrics uh, for years. And women were, that was considered to be inappropriate for a woman to use that sort of language. But, but Nicki Minaj was appropriating it and by doing so was empowered as a female. I pause this podcast to correct myself. It was not Nicki Minaj that sang the WAP song. It was Cardi B featuring Megan the Stallion. Sorry, Nicki. Back to the podcast. And then there was a great wave of uh, uh, opposition to that. You'd say, what? The thing she's saying, surely that's... that's uh, encouraging the the objectification of the female form of a woman of them being a s- s- objectified as a sexual thing right and uh, and using that language that's pulled from pornography and aggressive music mm-hmm. and uh, that surely is is that feminism is that is that empowering and there was an interesting conversation we kind of touched on that in the last podcast with esther and it's hard for me to talk i find hard to talk on the issues of gender empowerment so or certainly female empowerment as a man but it's it's certainly it, i'm glad you brought it up i'm just um probably adding a, uh, an uncomfortable amount of content to it <laughs> but you're right you know it's it, we these conversations don't play play I, I i'm so so blessed i i had a great childhood i've got two parents that loved me and protected me and when i got in trouble at school Yes, I was petrified, but mum and dad were going to be doubly angry. But actually, uh, when I found out, they, they loved me. They protected me. I'm so, so, so blessed. And I don't take that for granted. But we didn't talk about sex. It wasn't something we, we, that was made a, a topic of discussion. I grew up as a Christian kid, and, and I still am a, a Christian. And, and I don't think this is exclusively an issue for the church or for people of faith, be them Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or, or, or Hindu, or any faith. But I think there is something about the piety of, of religion and, and, and even more reasons not to talk about sex, to make presumptions that mm-hmm. our children, well, they are Christian or they're Muslim or they are a faith. Therefore, they shan't be breaching the codes of conduct or laws within that faith. They won't be having that. We don't need to worry about it. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe the teachers will talk about it or maybe I mean, it, 
if I think about you know how many conversations we've had in church about sex or I've experienced appalling in none you know none no decent ones it's just such an uncomfortable topic but I think we do need to talk about it more we do need to talk about it younger you can't you can't pretend your kid's not going to encounter I, think I read a study recently that extreme pornography you know children as young as 10 11 12 are ex experience if not younger are experiencing extreme pornography at that age now so you've got to be prepared to have these these conversations as difficult and uncomfortable it might be to, to add something to that lexi articulate that better than i just have would you yeah i think <laughs> no, that was great Save me. i think um i think you're you know you're spot on and doubling back a little bit on like the you know the fem the feminism stuff really that's um the the narrative of trying to like take the patriarchy and flip it against itself um is like it seems to be like a method of some feminism like some forms of feminism but really it's just a counterfeit like you're not like you're still functioning in the suppressive system that a man built in a, but you're in a different way instead, like, oh, well, I'm going to take the money instead of him taking the money. It's like, you're still within an oppressive system, you know, that requires you to look this way, act this way, you know, all of these different things in order to be desirable, in order to make money, all of that stuff. And is that really empowering? Are you just, I mean, I would say, I would say no. And I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, feeling good about how you look as a woman and owning your sexuality and, and all that stuff. I think that's perfectly fine and, and is a good and great thing because, you know, the, the pendulum swing, anytime the pendulum swings like way far one way or the other, it, it just comes with a lot of bad side effects, right? right, right. A lot, of, a lot of um, damage comes with that. And so I think that's what, you know, you know, as a woman and as someone who, you know, I was not just because I experienced um, sexual exploitation, but, you know, I've grown up in a very hypersexualized culture, seeing women on magazines my entire life look a certain way and just becoming aware of how that influences me and how I think and speak to myself, you know, within, within my own head and how I am getting stuck in oppressive systems, you know, and trying to determine, okay, is this actually empowering me? Or am I just trying to find a way to be happy in an abusive situation? Mm. Am I just trying to figure out how to cope in this? And it, you create a lot of, I think what happens is you create a lot of lies to stay in things that you have to believe in order to stay. And, and this is like, this, this will probably sound familiar to those that are familiar with women that stay in abusive uh, relationships. Like, what, you know, why do you stay? And you come up with all these reasons why, just because leaving is so difficult and so unknown and there just doesn't seem, or you can't see any other option. Like, oh, well, there's not really, under, this is it. I have to find a way to work with this. Um, but there, there's so much more out there as far as kids and preparing them. I think, you know, the way you think of it is like, okay, you're not going to, when your kid is learning to drive, you're not just going to throw them the keys and, and toss them in the car. Right. right. And good luck. Good luck. You know, like <laughs> probably best if you don't drive with, this is like a metaphor for having sex, right? It's probably best if you don't drive, but if you're going to, you know, just be on the lookout for, for signs and uh wear and, comfortable shoes right yeah <laughs> you know um but no like you get in as a, as a as a parent or a caring adult and you teach them how to use the car you teach them um you know how to pay attention to roadways and proper ways to drive so they don't end up dead in a ditch somewhere right and so i think we have to take that level of care on every level with our kids it's not just sex and relationships. It's like how to have friendships, how to um, function in a workplace, like how to do an interview and, and um, what's like a healthy work culture or not work culture. Like, you know, just 
putting in a little bit more work in like the soft skills area. And I think that's harder for parents. Like it's easy to just like go to work, throw some food on the table and keep a roof over their head. That's easy. Literally anyone can do that. The government does that for lots of kids. Okay. But what they actually need is the uh, emotional preparing and training to go through their, their whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's all I'll add there. I suppose the good thing is, is when we're talking to parents now, we're, we're not talking to our parents, are we? We're talking to people. Well, I'm 35 and my brother's a year older than me. He's got two beautiful girls. We're talking to people our age, right? I guess I I know you're younger than me, but um, I like to refer to people in one big broad category, especially younger people. I like to try and associate with younger people, keep me in the know. And, um, but we are so, so, so maybe there's some hope because it might be hard if, if someone listening to this, you can go, can you imagine my parents having conversations with me about, so I can't think of anything worse. (laughs) But actually, we're talking about ourselves now, aren't we? We're talking about this right. generation that are raising young children. It's on us to, it's on us to to be more proactive about dealing yep. with these topics. I wonder if it would be uh, indelicate or cumbersome to try and to ask you this because I wanted to ask you earlier, but but you, you speak so well, and this is a it's not totally coherent with what we've just covered. But I was thinking earlier on whilst you were talking and going through that period of, of realizing what had happened in a younger stage of your life. I wonder how you'd advise people to, to deal well with a family member or a friend or someone you're in a relationship with that starts to discover past trauma and whether there are things that you could say from your experience that were really unhelpful or really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could I lump that on the edge uh, in the head there no that's great um i think it's a great question and i think the least helpful thing that anyone can do is start asking a bunch of critical questions uh because it automatically communicates that you don't really believe them mm. even if you say the words i believe you if you quickly follow with almost sounding like an interrogator you know like well how'd that happen how did you meet them what were you wearing like mm. what you know why didn't you tell anybody, you know, did you tell your mom? It's just not the time and place. And you're really not the appropriate person. You know, honestly, I think whenever someone does that, I think what people need to understand is what's going on um, behind the scenes. I think this will help people like show a bit more care and compassion in these, in these moments where this happens. So I'll tell you that when I finally developed the courage and it took months, if not like years probably to develop the courage to finally tell someone because there's been so many threats and you've been so gaslit, you know, as, as someone um, that's gone through any, any amount of, of uh, sexual abuse trauma, but especially if you've been trafficked. And for me, I was threatened with um, the safety of my sister. They told me if I said anything that they would do the same thing to my sister. So that always, and you know, at the age of 10, you just take adults as like dead serious. Right. And so you have to understand, like when someone is gains the courage to say something to you, the amount of fear that they have to overcome to get the words out of their mouth, or they might not even be able to get the words out of their mouth. They might even like, I often had to write letters, um, to my parents. Um, I think that that's why you know, I'm, I'm a pretty well-spoken writer now, even more so than, than speaking, um, just because that was the primary way I, I was able to, you know, find the words to say. So know that they are terrified, absolutely terrified. It doesn't matter if it, it like they got raped one time or if they've been raped multiple times by the same person, if they're trafficked, they are absolutely terrified to come forward with this information because they don't know how you'll respond. And we're afraid that we're going to be treated differently. We're afraid that people are going to like kind of pity you and kind of like, you know, just treat you um, almost like a child, but you're an adult or sometimes, you know, you are a child or you're a teenager and you, you just, no one wants pity. That doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel empowering. And so knowing that, that when someone comes forward, that's kind of what's going on. Right. So what to say after, 
I tell people try to find more words than I'm so sorry. And if that's all you can do, cause you are shocked, that's fine. You can always come back and express yourself better later. But if you can sit with yourself in the moment and show some emotion, there's kind of a, there's kind of a mid ground though. Like you don't want to show too emotion, too much emotion to make this, the person feel like, oh my gosh, that was way too much for them. Like they can't handle this. Cause that's a fear that all of us have is that um, this information is going to be, it's too much for us to carry. Right. And so we know it's a lot and we are afraid by telling people that we're going to be burdening them yeah. with this information. So if you just like break down sobbing, they're going to be like, Oh, okay. Like they can't handle anything else I have to say. And just know whatever you're getting first is like the bare minimum of what's actually probably happened to them and what they're actually dealing with. So most people, I think in most situations, you kind of get a blank stare (laughs) and then followed with, I'm so sorry that that happened, Um, which is a great start. That's better than like, are you sure? Mm. Or anything like that. But if you can sit for a moment and think about how that makes you feel like I'm so angry that that happened, or it makes me so sad that someone stole your innocence or, um, that you've been carrying this by yourself for so long. I'm so glad you told me so I can help carry some of this with you. Like, wow. Like that's like, so that says so much more, um, than just like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. It, that's just such a, it's such a cliche thing. It really has no meaning to tell someone that you're, you're, you're sorry for them. Cause you say the same thing. If someone spills a cup of coffee, Oh, I'm so sorry. You spilled your cup. And then you're going to say the same thing for, Oh, I'm so sorry that you were raped at the age of 10. It just, you know, it doesn't really match the crime. <laughs> um, and I think following it with, you know, how, how can I help you carry this or what do you want to do now? And empowering people with choice. I think a lot of times when, when we hear uh, about someone's trauma, we go into like a crisis response mode and wanting to like fix it. We just want to like fix it and make it better. And so we're like, oh, I know a therapist. I know this. And we just start, like, we just like resource fire hose people, but they, never, they might not be ready for that. They might not want that. Like what they just did is like a huge, huge, huge step. And that's enough for them that day, that moment to be completely honest. Like we don't need to go further than that unless they are in a state of uh, being suicidal or, you know, being harmful to themselves or others, then that's a little bit different. And, um, you know, you obviously need to get a professional involved in that situation, but most of the time they just, you know, finally want to tell a friend because they're, it's crushing them and they just need someone else to know because that alone helps it feel a little bit lighter and giving them as much choice as possible is super important because you have to understand when someone has been, um, raped, abused, exploited, um, all of their choice has been completely removed. All their consent has been completely removed. All of their control has been completely removed. So, when you interact with anyone that has had that experience, the more you can give them those things, um, you're actually helping them heal by doing that. You're helping them heal by giving them the option to exercise that um, because you literally lose those skills. You lose the skill to um, advocate for yourself and try to make that happen. You know, So for example, if, if someone's trying to make an appointment and they're like, Hey, will this time work? A lot of times this friend would be like, oh yeah, sure. Even if it doesn't work at all. And they're going to have to like way rearrange their life and it's going to be so stressful. And they're not going to say, actually, no, it doesn't work. You know, will this day work better? It's because those skills have been completely stripped from them. So as a friend, as a family member, as someone, you know, even just having that response of like, you know, how do you, how do you want to, what do you want to do next? You know, what do you imagine that, that looking like? it gives them full control of how you're going to respond, which is really the scary part of telling people because you don't know how they're going to respond and what's going to happen, you know, like, are people going to force me to, you know, do all these different things. So I hope that makes some sense and gives people a little more context. So good. So good. So valid. Those points were brilliant. You've given us so many great takeaways from this, this conversation. Lexi, thank you so much. So I'm going to end with the same question that's posed to every guest, which is what gives you hope? 
what gives you hope for our future? I think what gives me hope is every human's ability to heal and evolve and become better. I think when we all do that work for ourselves, um, collectively, we become a better society, a better culture, um, better friends, better family, better parents. So that's, that's my hope is that right. things, things can change people, people can change. Yes. Yes, indeed. And how can we support you in, in your advocacy and your work? Yeah. So, uh, feel free to find me on Instagram. My handle is Lex the advocate naturally, obviously. <laughs> um, and you know, if anyone, um, has listened to this and, uh, you know, professionally, you're like, wow, there was a lot there, even from like a psychological standpoint that could really inform your work or your business or something, feel free to reach out to me. That's what I do. I do, I'm a trauma informed consultant. And so I look at, you know, different systems, whether it's law enforcement, law, uh, even a business that works with survivors or a nonprofit or different things and figure out, you know, how to make it more trauma informed and therefore more successful in being able to combat sex trafficking and supporting um, survivors of a violent crime or um, of human trafficking. Wow. Yeah. What a brilliant, what a brilliant cause that you're championing. Championing it. Oh, what a brilliant cause you're championing, Lexi. I'm never going to use that word ever again. Lexi, it's been great having you on the podcast. I've really enjoyed us chatting. And like I said, I think there's so much, so much in this. I'm looking forward to listening back to it actually and excavating it for, for wisdom. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. Thanks for having me. Isn't Lexi a talented communicator? I would totally book her to come and speak to my school, business, church, police force about how to better respond to survivors of abuse and exploitation. There were loads of learning points there. I think the advice Lexi had for parents about trusting your instincts and inviting your children into a healthy dialogue on the subject of sex and sexual intimacy Children might get an input of sorts at school on sex education, but I can almost guarantee it will be woeful. If it was anything like my memories of Mrs. Wright demonstrating aggressively how to put a condom onto a plastic penis, which in truth did nothing other than to terrify every boy in the classroom and cause us all to cross our legs in sympathy for the educational phallus being so unsympathetically handled. The fact of the matter is that children are accessing pornography at a younger and younger age. A study in 2016 found that 94% of children who had admitted viewing pornography did so by the age of 14. A few years later, a study in 2019 by the British Board of Film Classification found that children as young as 7 or 8 years old are encountering hardcore pornography. This is not a subject that parents and teachers should be passing around like a hot potato, hoping that the other party will deal with it. Dialogue, openness, instinct. It's interesting because it chimes with what Alani Bankhead, the special agent from Hawaii who we spoke to earlier on in the podcast series, what she said. The best way to protect your children online is to love them take an interest in their lives and ask them to share with you who they're talking to online or what they may have encountered. I also thought a major takeaway for me is what Lexi said about how to respond to a friend or a loved one who reveals to you that they have suffered trauma, in this instance, sexual abuse, and how searching questions really don't help. When did this happen? What did they look like? Why didn't you tell me? But a more appropriate response might be to thank them for their confidence in you and committing to walk with them and support them however you possibly can. It's good stuff, isn't it? You can follow Lexi on Instagram at Lexi the Advocate. Do reach out to her if you think that her consultancy might aid you in some way. On the next episode, I'm talking with Benji Nolo, the director of the documentary Nefarious Merchant of Souls, which Lexi referred to at the start of our conversation. 
Benji is also the founder of the Exodus Cry campaign group. So do listen in on that one. This podcast was produced by Blue Bear Coffee Company. We fight slavery through coffee. Come check us out at bluebearcoffee.com or follow us on social media at Blue Bear Coffee Co. Sending love wherever you are. Keep fighting the good fight. Peace.